Shabbat Shalom. I mentioned last night, and I think it's fitting to do so again, that I have deep ties to this community in that um, my college roommate was Jeremy Benstein, who was the grandson of Rabbi Adler. Um, so I grew to adulthood uh, familiar with this community and with one of your great rabbis, and then had the good fortune when I was in rabbinical school and as a young rabbi to uh, be lucky enough to attract the attention of Rabbi Erwin Groner, who was, as you know, uh, a man of extraordinary dignity and wisdom and influence, and he was gracious enough to be a mentor and a friend to me across the years, um, as is his magnificent wife, Lipsa, who continues to radiate charm and dignity and compassion uh, in the way she moves in the world. I'm so grateful to be here um, and look forward to getting to speak together later on in the weekend. My father, in the 1960s and 70s, put together the most successful and largest answering service in the Bay Area. And he had offices in San Francisco and in Oakland and in the peninsula, and it was an extraordinary business. The challenge, of course, with the answering service business is that it never anticipated the rise of personal computers and the iPhone. And so try as he might, making the very best possible answering service ultimately had to give way to a new age and to new technology. Now, I share that with you because it is both the burden and the challenge of Judaism that in every age, it has to reinvent itself. There are elements of our tradition that we hold to across the ages. There are things that we have always stood for and must always stand for, regardless of the times. But how we package those core commitments, well, that has to be responsive to the needs of each age. When Jews first came to this country, and I'm going to skip the generations that came with Peter Stuyvesant and through the Civil War, those Jews were unsuccessful in creating a lasting legacy. Their descendants, by and large, mingled and merged into the larger population. They were not able to produce something that was self-perpetuating. The second beginning of the Jewish community in the United States was those Jews who were fleeing Tsarist Russia and the Pale of Settlement in Poland. Those Jews continue to be the ancestors of most of us. And they were the ones who addressed the issue of how do we create some continuity with our Jewish past while at the same time creating a Judaism that can thrive and contribute on this continent. They were able to do the work of taking greenhorns, people who were marginal to American culture, whose primary language was Yiddish, who weren't really able to mingle with the broader American culture, and they were able to establish institutions which instilled Jewish pride, which taught Jewish values, and at the same time began the work of Americanizing these people who had come from all across Eastern Europe and the Pale of Settlements. They built synagogues on the Lower East Side, in places where Jews settled, and those synagogues were deliberately designed to help Americanize the Jews who were there. The founding of HUC, the Reform Center of Learning, the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is one of the conservative movement seminaries located in New York, those places were deliberately crafted to resemble other American institutions of higher learning. We take for granted now that to become a rabbi, you go to an accredited institution where you're taught by people who have doctoral degrees. But you know as well as I do 
that for a good 1800 years in Baghdad and in Cairo and in Paris and in Poland, rabbis did not get trained by people who wrote doctoral dissertations. That's a unique American response to a new age. The generation that created these institutions was so successful that their children were able to move out of their Jewish ghettos and into the suburbs, creating an entirely different agenda. The agenda of their children was how in beautiful communities like this one could we take our place among non-Jewish institutions as contributors to the larger culture. And so the very architecture of this building, magnificent building, speaks of that second and third generation of Jews creating a place that is proudly American. We've been singing a lot of American patriotic melodies today. That's not coincidental to the mission of the institution, which was to say both to those on the inside but also to those on the outside, we are as American as any other group of Americans. And we have obligations that commit us not only to parochial self-interested issues, but also to broader concerns about the nature of society, about being broadly literate. Now, there too, I want to say in praise of those generations, they were outlandishly successful. I will give you some evidence that would have been impossible to imagine for my grandparents or for yours. Do you know that the number one most popular demographic for marriage in this country is the Jewish male? They polled non-Jewish women in this country. If you had your option, which categories would you, the number one group every single year, my wife insists that's because they don't really know us. <laughs> and there is some evidence for that. But the number one guy that American women want to marry in theory is us. That's astonishing. <laughs> Every single presidential candidate in the last presidential election, both of them, had Jewish sons-in-law. That's astonishing. And Joe Biden has one too. He has a daughter-in-law now. So everybody has Jewish mishpacha these days. Right? That's a level of success unprecedented. The number of Jews who attend the top universities all around this country, the number of Jews who serve in the Congress, the number of Jews who are on the Supreme Court, well, it's enough to think that the anti-Semites may be onto something, right? Because we are disproportionately engaged in the entertainment industry as leaders of business, I'm not here saying everything is rosy. I'm going to get to the problems in a moment. But I want to give credit to the Jews who came before us, who had the foresight and the vision to build institutions that nurtured their children with Jewish identity and yet also brought them out into the world. It's an extraordinary achievement unparalleled in the history of the Jewish people. And then there are things that have also changed since then. If the big issue in the past, if the pressing problem that faced the generations before us was how to become real Americans, we have so succeeded in that endeavor that that's no longer a concern for our children or grandchildren. They take for granted that they are Americans. The question that they want to know is why bother struggling with all this Jewish stuff? Why do I need to retain an identity as a Jew when we go to the same schools as everybody else? 
We date the same people as everybody else. We have the same professions as everybody else. And we live in the same neighborhoods as everybody else. So you understand that all of our institutions were designed to meet an agenda that is no longer the primary concern of young Jews today. They're not struggling for a foothold into American culture. What they want to understand is why should they make the sacrifices and efforts to retain a Jewish identity when they're perfectly comfortable out in the world. And for that, we need to be no less creative than were the Jews who came before us. Now I want to highlight what remains constant. And I'm going to give you a very rabbinic opinion on this. So feel free to disagree with me. Many in my family do. What is singular about the Jewish people across the ages is that from our very first moments as a people, we committed ourselves to being in an intimate relationship with the Holy One. We committed ourselves as a people to a life of covenant. And we placed covenant at the very center of Jewish civilization. Has it ever occurred to you that there is no such thing as Jewish architecture? There are lots of Jews who are very good architects. But there's nothing distinctively Jewish about any architectural style. The earliest Israelite homes in the Iron Age in the land of Israel look just identical to the Canaanite homes. Nothing original. The temple that King Solomon built is a Mesopotamian and Lebanese model synagogue, kind of Beit Knesset. Right? The synagogues are simply two-room houses, very common in the Roman period in any public building. Right? And this building as well, glorious and beautiful as it is, doesn't have distinctively Jewish architectural features. We use whatever everyone else is using, and then we try to do it a little bigger and slightly more gaudy. <laughs> because, let's face it, everything looks better spray-painted with gold on it. I learned that in the Catskills. <laughs> There's no Jewish cuisine. We didn't invent bagels and lox. The Scandinavians and the Slavs did that. We just made it famous because we're good at marketing. Hummus and pita is not an originally Jewish food. That's an Arab food. We've also given it a run in America, right? But, but there's no distinctive Jewish things to eat. We eat whatever our neighbors eat. The one area of distinction culturally that has changed the world is in the realm of spirit. And I want to just marvel at that for a moment. I want to hold out a miracle that happens so often we don't even notice it. Play with me a mental experiment. Imagine that I was to reveal to you that down the block there's a group of Girgashites. You may forget, but there were seven Canaanite nations that surrounded us. The Hittites, the Hivites, the Girgashites, and others. Well, they just discovered a group of Hittites down the road and they meet once a week and they take out their old Hittite literature in the ancient Hittite language. And they continue to pray to their ancient Hittite divinity in the original language, even though they've been wandering for thousands of years. We've just discovered them in Springfield. You know that news like that would mean that every major publication in the world would be flying in to film this extraordinary thing. Who could imagine that kind of cultural continuity, a tiny little Semitic people who have managed to hold on to their culture, pray to their God, hold on to their language, hold on to their literature, despite everything. It would be on Fox News, it would be on CBS, it would be on all the major media, the New York Times would be flying in, it would be big. And yet, you witness that miracle every week. The only reason you don't think about it as miraculous is because it's so common. There is a little tiny Semitic tribe that has held on to its language, its God, its culture, its scripture, 
across the millennia. It meets all over the world. And you don't think of how miraculous it is because you grew up with it. You've seen it everywhere you go, but it's extraordinary. So the miracle of Jewish continuity is that having placed covenant as our primary mission in the world, we not only succeeded in surviving despite everything, and I don't need to tell you what everything is, but we have also touched humanity. Our two daughter religions, Christianity and Islam, account for more than half of humanity. And they think of Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Isaiah, as their prophets too. And they are. They think of those Ten Commandments that are alluded to above me as speaking to them as well, and they are. The notion of the humanity of all people is predicated on one God having made all of us. That's why it says in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Hebrew and Jewish insights gave birth to democracy and established a vision of human dignity and freedom so radical that we don't live up to it even today. But it continues to be our North Star, directing how we need to move and where we need to go, and by which we judge our own actions. That can never change. The core business of the Jewish people is to create communities of compassion and righteousness and justice in loyalty to the God who called us into being. We are to be a role model for humanity and a partner with any person of goodwill who shares that commitment. But the style, my friends, the style has to change. In synagogues around the country, we belt out the same prayers with the same melodies and then wonder why the young people don't show up. We're still working on making a better answering service, oblivious to the fact that there are iPhones out there. And so the question I want to leave you with is, what would be the Jewish iPhone? What are the ways that we can hold to the mission, modify the packaging, such that it can speak to the needs of a new generation? And I want to offer a couple possibilities. The first is, we have to move into cyberspace. We have to be able to create programmings that meet people where they are. You heard mention that I am the father of twins. When I was in Uganda, installing the chief rabbi of Uganda, who went to the Ziegler School, I was given a Swahili name by one of the local chieftains because he believed that I was the chief rabbi of the United States. <laughs> I forgive you for laughing there. And and if you are ever in Uganda, I would ask you to do me the favor of not correcting them on that. <laughs> My Swahili name is Walusansa Salango. Walusansa means reeds, like what grows by the banks of the Nile River. And Salango is father of twins. Okay. As a father of twins, I had many sleepless nights with my kids who took turns staying awake so that I would be maximally exhausted and battered down by the time they were teenagers. They were successful at that. But that gave me a lot of time to think about what needs to change, what needs to be different in order to reach them and their generation. My kids grew up not having to listen 
to what a radio station wanted to play. And it wouldn't occur to them to be told, well, if you're not willing to listen to what the DJ chooses, that means you don't like music. But that's more or less what we say to young people in the Jewish community. If you don't come into our buildings and you don't attend our programs when we schedule them, then you're not committed to the Jewish people. But that's wrong. It's just wrong. The other thing I learned when I had twins is that I don't care how good your program is on Wednesday night, there's no way I'm going to be able to get out of this house. So we can't keep offering the same things in the same ways. We have to put talks out there. I will share with you that I have a public figure Facebook page that I use to put talks out on. I put pieces of Torah wisdom on. I have about 60,000 followers and climbing, right? These are people who may or may not be affiliated with institutions. About, about two-thirds of them are not Jewish. About 10% of them are Muslims from Arabic countries. I routinely hear from people who say things like, hello, my name is Ahmad, I come from Cairo, I've never met a Jew, and you're my rabbi. That's a remarkable thing for this age. There are people who are open to wisdom wherever it comes from, even from a rabbi in America. So that's how we're going to have to reach people, is by producing quality material that can be where people are and where they are gathering these days, like it or don't, is online. I'll tell you another story of online reality. We're on family vacation in Hawaii. You know, one of the perks of living in California is it's a direct flight for five hours and then you're in Maui. So we're in Maui with the kids and we're doing the family thing. Dad's driving, mom is telling me I'm driving badly, the kids are in back. I look in the rear view mirror and my daughter Shira has her computer open and she's texting someone on her computer. And I say what any father of teenagers would say. I'm sure you're inspired now to say the same thing, guys, which is, Shira, there are world-class oceans here. There are world-class mountains here. Close your computer. She says to me with a tone of smugness that only a 16-year-old girl can master, she says, Daddy, I am texting my friends, and people matter more than beaches. Okay, she won. Can't argue that. We project what we think community ought to look like, and then we don't notice the rich communities that our kids actually have. So we have to find ways to bring our message into them. The second thing I want to emphasize is we have raised our children in such a way that they have broad human concerns. They may be proud of being Jewish, they may love being Jewish, they may love Israel. I hope that that's true and I hope that that continues. But they are also understanding that they have a stake in the future of our planet, in the health of our country, in the nature of the world. If you pose them as opposites, either you're a proud Jew or you're a universalist, we lose the next generation. They refuse to make that choice. Which means that the language of our Judaism has to be the language of wisdom. Guilt won't work anymore. And so we need to figure out ways to offer Judaism because everybody is desperate to figure out how to live more meaningful lives. And Judaism has been building rich human communities for thousands of years. The reason to engage Jewish community may or may not include theology for some people, but it is beyond question that you live a better life when you live it with other people, when you live it in the broad flow of meaning and values that have sustained our people and all people for thousands of years. And so I'd like us to offer a vision of a Judaism resurgent. 
I'd like us to think that in what the media keeps reporting on as this bleak time, bleak for conservative Judaism, bleak for the other denominations, th the number of people, incidentally, applying to rabbinical school is down by about a quarter from what it was 20 years ago. Meanwhile, the number of rabbinical schools has doubled, right? That means everyone's trying to produce rabbis and less people want to be rabbis, or as the way I like to phrase it, they don't know that they really want to be rabbis, right? But in that age, we have to be able to trust that our new leaders will come up with ways of packaging the ancient wisdom in ways that can then speak to the broader generation. This has to be, to use Reagan's terms, mourning in America. This has to be where we have an honest and frank assessment of what is no longer working, and then we adjust it for the sake of our mission. But if we do that, I want to share the vision of the prophet Isaiah, who believed that he was speaking only to a Shearit, a remnant of his people. He thought there weren't going to be Israel soon. Moses Maimonides, great medieval scholar, when he wrote his book, he thought he was writing it to the last generation of Jews. We have been skirting on the brink of extinction for as long as we have been a people. And we will, with God's help, continue to moan and worry about our future for another several thousand years, for as long as God needs us. If we marinate ourselves in the wisdom of our tradition, if we rise with the same level of creativity as our parents and our grandparents and our ancestors mustered in their time, if we are faithful to our God and to each other, and if we trust the goodness of our children and their friends, so that if we empower them, they will help create a Judaism that will make us uncomfortable. They'll sing the wrong melodies, they'll dress the wrong way, they'll dye their hair and pierce their ears and do all kinds of weird stuff that we'll have the pleasure of mocking them for. But the last story I want to share about this new kind of Judaism, I belong to a non-denominational community called Ikar. And what's extraordinary about Ikar is that I'm one of the oldest people there. That doesn't happen in Jewish circles much. But at Ikar, I'm the old guy. So the rabbi created what she calls Jerusalem Shabbat. It's a Friday night service in a solarium with no chairs and really loud music, and people jump and sweat into each other for an hour and a half doing Kabbalat Shabbat and the Amidah and whatever. The melodies are atrocious. At the end of this hour and 15 minutes of standing and having all these young people sweating on me, Rabbi Browse comes over to me and she says, so Brad, what did you think? I said, Sharon, I have two things to say to you. The first is, I have been to Jerusalem. They have chairs. The second and more important thing I want to tell you is that the day you start worrying about whether I like the service is the day you start closing Ikar. I hated the service, but I loved that there were 200 young Jews jumping and singing and doing Jewish. So don't worry about whether I like the service or not. I like what I'm seeing. And that means you need to not worry about me. That means that part of our job is to make possible Jewish content that we ourselves don't like, that is not aimed for us. There will always be synagogues, there will always be a place for services like this. This is not a failure, this is a success. I love this service. So I'm not saying we stop doing what we're currently doing. What I am saying is in the age of the iPod, it is no longer one size fits all. It's deciding what it is different groups need and then finding ways for all of those needs to be met, sometimes together and sometimes separately. But if we do that, if we 
empower our community and make possible the creation of modes of Jewish living that we may ourselves not like, but we measure the success not by whether it speaks to us, but does it speak to our grandchildren, then I have no doubt that God and the Jewish people will continue to shine light well beyond our lifetimes and for millennia to come. Shabbat Shalom.